All right, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview with uh, Bernard Lockwood, Days in Hicksville, New York, the 26th of June, 2003. Um, it's approximately 1.50 p.m. The interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Bernard Lockwood. Uh, my date of birth is August 18th, 21. Okay, and place of birth was Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I was attending City College in New York, uptown. I was taking a Bachelor of Science degree. And, uh, and then I had left the college and, and stopped working for the Navy. And I was working for the Navy in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Uh, we went to ship fitter school for them. And uh, I worked in the Navy Yard on the battleship New Jersey. Uh, I was a young kid. I didn't know really anything about it. But since I went to the school, they said I was doing well. I could read blueprints. So they put me in charge of putting in the, uh, the gun turrets on the battleship New, Jer New Jersey. Um, were you enlisted? Did you enlist or did you were No, you I, was, I was drafted. Okay. I thought I would stay with the Navy. Mm -hmm. I was uh, working for the Navy. The Army drafted me and that canceled the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, did they ask for volunteers for the Air Corps or did you, uh, were you assigned to it? No, they asked for volunteers. Uh, I originally, uh, I originally was at Camp Upton and when I was first drafted, and at Camp Upton, they late at night they had the some kind of test they gave us, intelligence test or whatever it was. And the next morning, everybody was shipping out, and I was left behind. I didn't know where I was going. To be frank with you, and uh, they told me since you were in the Navy, you'd probably go into combat engineers, once you work for the Navy, and you know you're doing that kind of thing. But uh, the Air Corps came. I remember I saw two lieutenants with wings in their uh, lapels. Uh, mm -hmm. So I know I was in the Air Corps, and I, he said, well, you're not going with the rest of them. You're going with us, uh, and you're going to be on a troop train, and we'll take you down to the troop train. They took me to the troop train in a, in a car, and I, uh, I, I got on the troop train, and the troop train went to Miami Beach. And I took my basic training there. But they put me on KP and uh, guard duty. And I said, I never want to do that again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, from uh, Miami Beach, I went on to uh, New Jersey, to Atlantic City. And I was waiting to be assigned. I thought there was going to be a sign to it in school. And they had LaGuardia Field already. And there was a, an army school there, the Air Corps. And I thought I'd be assigned to that. And I waited, but I wasn't. Uh, from there, I went to, Clo uh, to uh, Amarillo, Texas. And Amarillo was a, really a B-20, B-17 base. They had B-25s and B-17s, but mainly B-17s. Most of those fellows were taking up mechanics, and they became uh, ground crew and crew chiefs on B-17s. So I went through that school. And when I graduated that school, I thought I'd go to England, because everybody there was shipping out to England. They were going to be with the 8th Air Force, but I didn't go. From there, I went to a gunnery school in Denver, Colorado. Okay. Um, when did you uh, find out that you were being assigned? Were you assigned to B-29s right away? or? No, from Denver, I went to uh, Boeing Aircraft Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was taking like a flight engineer's course and also uh, maintenance for the airplane. 
and all the systems, electrical and vacuum and all of that. And most of them were offices. I wasn't. Uh, the offices became flight engineers, and the enlisted men became tail gutters. <laughs> That's how it worked. And uh, when Boeing, when uh, a plane came off the line, they said I'd be assigned to that plane. And they flew that plane to Clovis, New Mexico. At Clovis, New Mexico, I saw a B-29, not too many. They just had a few. And uh, originally, I was assigned to Colonel Northrop, but Colonel Northrop became head of the, uh, the, uh, the bomb group, and then the bomb squadron later on. But uh, I got assigned to a crew there. They made up the B-29 crews there. I first got on flying status back when I was, I skipped it point, when I was at Amarillo. I didn't want to do any more KP or anything. I volunteered for flying status. I took the physical and I passed. And then I saw in the next few days my name was on flying status. So I didn't have to do that anymore. And then I went to gunnery school and then to Boeing. From Boeing to Clovis. In Clovis I was on a B-20. Assigned to a B-29. It was B-29 crew. Did your crew stay together? Not the whole crew. We stayed together from Clovis. We went to Amarillo, not Amarillo, yeah, you know, uh, Salina, Kansas. There were three, three or four air bases that were training B-29 crews. And Salina was the main one, the big one. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now did you, uh, it's once you picked your B-29 up, did you stay with that plane or did no, you? No, no, no. Uh, we got assigned a uh, first lieutenant as a pilot. I'll tell him I'm Lieutenant Summers. And we were training with him. And I personally didn't think he was really could fly a B-29. He was a good fighter pilot, you know what I mean? But not a B-29 pilot. He couldn't fly formation well. And uh, we were on a mission, and uh, we cracked up. Uh, it wasn't his fault in one way. Uh, we were coming in, and we had an engine caught on fire. And we had to come in for emergency landing. And uh, a whack put us on a downwind runway by mistake. And when he came down, he hit very hard, and we couldn't make it. He, he, he overshot the runway. And he pulled up, we made a go around, try again. And we came in again, and uh, when he came in, she put us on this runway, and uh, we had a wind shear, and when he hit it so hard, he had broken the nose wheel, and the front of the plane went down, and she just skidded, and we all ran out. We all got out. Now, where was this? Was this in training in the United States? In training. Uh -huh. in, uh, yeah, in the United States. Uh -huh. Did the plane burn up? It started to. They put it out. And, uh, you know, it was like a little smoldery. I don't think uh -huh. it was anything. The, the fire department came right out and put out the uh, fire. And uh, from there, well, they took us back to uh, Salina, Kansas. And at Salina, they uh, took him off the crew. And they assigned us a... Uh, Major. And the Major, when we were flying with uh, the other fellow, we really didn't have a B-29 too much. We flew B-25s and we flew B-17s. They didn't have B-29s. Mm -hmm. There was hardly any planes that were there. Two, three planes, that's all. There wasn't any planes. And uh, so when we were with him, with him, we were on the low end of the totem pole, you know. He was, he was a first lieutenant, but they had higher rank captains and majors flying the 29s. Mm -hmm. So we were waiting for a plane. And what happened is that uh, we never got a plane, but when we got the major, he had rank. So we got a B-29 for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we started training on it. But we were so far, far behind the missions, training missions, because they would fly to different places, uh, like over the Gulf of Mexico or 
over to New York, uh, over to the Empire State Building and use it as a target and fly back and things like that, training missions. But we were so far behind. So the commander, the chief there, he called us the goof up crew because everybody was ready to go and we were left behind. So even when they went overseas, we were left behind. So they said, catch up with your missions. So we catch up, they, he got us a tow target, guy flying a tow target that we could practice shooting on. So we had a little experience with it. So from there, we had this fellow and uh, we, we were getting ready to go overseas. But I wanted to get married before I went overseas. So I, had a, I couldn't get back to New York. It's a peculiar thing, you won't believe this. I was engaged to a girl in Texas that I had met and she was engaged to a fellow in New York that she met. But I heard that she was getting married. My mother wrote me a letter. So I said, I got to get to New York and I don't want to go AWOL. But Colonel Northrop, who was the colonel for the group, he was going to New York over a weekend and he said, get all the ballot fellows from Brooklyn and New York and I'll fly you to New York. So he flew us. And uh, on a Saturday, I remember, and we landed, we couldn't land anywhere. Nobody would take us. Uh, we were flying a B-17. It was the old Suzy Q from the 8th Air Force came in, and they fixed it up and we flew that. We flew it to New York, and we couldn't land anywhere. Every place we went, they turned us away. So, uh... Do you know why? I, they said, uh, well, we told them it was a B-29 crew, but we weren't flying a B-29. We were flying a B-17. They said that one runway wasn't long enough, and this thing and that thing, and we were running out of gas. So the colonel says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And he came and he landed. We went to Mitchell Field and they turned us away, but he didn't listen. He, he came in. He landed the plane at Mitchell Field. And we had to go in front of the commanding general of the Eastern Command because we, he disobeyed orders. But we had buttons that said B-29 on it, B-29 crew. And really, at that time, we were under the, the control of the President of the United States and the commanding general of the Air Force, because the B-29s were in the 20th Air Force. And the 20th Air Force, the commanding general that he took for his own Air Force was Hap Arnold. And Hap Arnold was the commanding general of all the Air Forces. So Hap Arnold, they gave us these B-29 buttons, and they said, you don't say anything wherever you land, even on a practice mission. You'll be restricted to the base because you're on a an airplane that you're not supposed to talk about, and that's it. So uh, I said, I got to get in to see my wife in Brooklyn. So they they calmed down a little, the commanding general, and he says, we'll get you in with a weapons carrier, but you have to stay in your flight suit, and you can't take your parachute with you. You, you have to take it with you. You can't leave it here. I said, all right, no problem. I said, well, I got to get to Brooklyn. You're already taking me to New York. He said, well, you'll catch the subway there. I said, okay, and that's what I did. And people were looking at me because it was wartime, but here I am with a, in a flight suit with a, I had a chest, uh, a chest thing over here, which was my parachute, and I was holding it on my lap. People thought I was nuts, you know, why did I leave it somewhere? But I couldn't help myself. I went to get my wife, and she was at a girlfriend's house. That's the one that was going to get married to someone else. I went to the girlfriend's house, I got a taxi, and I went over there. And I told her, you're crazy. She said, hey, you're engaged too. I said, forget it. I said, we went through each other before, and we're made for each other. So I said, well, you got to get married, and I'm going overseas, I'm sure. So you got to come out. So I said, we'll get engaged right away. But I didn't have a game to be ring to give her. I told my mother to get her a ring and give her a ring. And we got our reservations on a reservations on a railroad and she came out to Salina and I wanted to get married. But at Salina we didn't have a chaplain there. So that was a problem. 
So they, we went from there, we got a, a pass to go to, uh, I don't remember, that it was an, uh, it was a, a base for, uh, for, what uh, they have horses, what do you call them? Uh, uh, it was Eisenhower's old base. A cavalry? Cavalry unit. Uh -huh. But that cavalry was replaced with tanks, it was uh -huh. a tank unit. And there was a chaplain there, and we got married Saturday night, and I came back. And then uh, her mother came, just seeing her mother, we got married. And uh, then they, uh, she stayed with me for a couple of weeks, so I didn't know where I was going. Of course, from there they sent me to a small town, they didn't want anybody to be 20 lines with it. was one block long. And they didn't want everybody to know there's 29s there. And they had a big 29 base. And uh, I stayed there for a couple of weeks. And then it was Harrington, Kansas. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was so cold there. And I you just had a, I didn't even have an overcoat or anything. I wore my, well, I, I had a leather. I have a picture of my crew. I had a leather jacket. I wore the leather jacket. That's all I had. But uh, from there, we went to Lawrence, Kansas. And Lawrence, Kansas, we were going over this. Uh, well, we went to Lawrence, Kansas first, and then to Harrington. From Harrington, we were going to, over to go overseas. We went to Sacramento to made the field. That was a depot where everybody in 29s were processed before you went overseas. And we went over from there. We took off in a snowstorm. They had taken off the, uh, the uh, what controls the snow things on the wings. Uh, I forget what you call oh, it. Oh, the anti-ice. Anti uh, anti-ice ice device. They yeah. took it and we kicked off in a terrible snowstorm, an ice storm. And, uh, the major, he wanted to take off. His wife went home. He wants off. So we went off. And we didn't get very far because the wings started to ice up. And he gave the order to throw everything out out of the plane. The plane was getting heavy. He couldn't hold it up. He says, we're going to crash. So I'm not going to crash a V-29. He says, throw everything out. I remember he told me, take out a hatchet. There were brand new engines they had put crosswise with cables in the, in the uh, Bombay. Mm -hmm. So we go in there and cut the cables. Must have dropped in some farmer's backyard. Oh my God. <laughs> Must have been ready, plenty of money. I felt terrible, but that was it. That's what he told me to do. And we went, to, we came to May the field. And from May then we went back and forth a few times because the airplane smelled gas. We had to go back. From May then we went to Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor, he smashed again. The, let me say about the B-29, a reference in written to all people. The B-29 should have never been taken out of Boeing. Boeing knew that, but they needed these planes. They needed the big heavy bombers. They wanted to bomb Japan from a base. So really they didn't test it out. It overheated. The cow flaps weren't set right. Uh, uh, it was terrible. And when we start bombing, in fact, uh, from, from Pearl Harbor, we broke the nose gear. The nose gear was, they had to send for a new one again. We waited two days, they had a new one, the mechanics fixed it. From there, we flew to uh, Kwajalein, and that was terrible. I landed at Kwajalein, I asked the Marines, were there, what smells on this island? It was terrible. Order. They said, the Japanese dead are here. I said, why don't you bury him? He says, we're going to do that. We have no time. <laughs> so we're making the runway longer. So he says, uh, when time comes, they'll be buried. In the meantime, you're here. You won't be here long. He said, overnight, tomorrow morning, you're leaving. They didn't tell us where to go. And the major never said where we were going until we got in the air. But when I came out the, uh, about 4 in the morning, they got us up. I don't know if I'm boring you with all No, no, not at all. No, this is what we... I went with the uh, 
we went and we, the goal of when I came out, and I went that morning to the plane. I wanted to check out the gun turrets myself. And I did, and uh, I see there was ammunition, and we never carried ammunition from, uh, from Pearl Harbor to there. But the, the armorers there put ammunition in the guns. They said, you're liable to hit Jap planes because there's uh, Jap ships out there, and they may be an aircraft carrier. You may hit Jap planes, so you have to be armed. So we came to Saipan during the middle of an air raid. The Japs were bombing Saipan. So they hollered for us to stop, leave the plane, and run out and jump into a foxhole nearby. And that's what we did until the air raid was over. And then we started our, our missions. It didn't take long. I landed there in late December of 44. And they started our missions. But the first mission was a terrible one. We had the rank, you know, he was a full major, and uh, we became, we were a goof-up crew overseas, but they needed crews, so a lot of, we weren't in the first batch that originally went to that, so a lot of crews were ditched or got shut down, so they needed crews. So he had the rank and the experience. He could, the major could trim up a plane that you never knew you were flying. It was terrific at it. And we flew on that mission. And when you're flying over the water to avoid the radar, but we told them we're getting past Mount Fuji in a little while from now, climb to get up to the, to the IP for the target. He said he had plenty of time. Well, we didn't have plenty of time. By the time we start climbing and we got up to 30,000 feet, there was nobody there. The, the planes we're supposed to lead in weren't there. But they got on the intercom later and told us they're heading back. They couldn't wait anymore. They didn't have enough gas. They wouldn't make it back home if they kept waiting for us. So we told them, drop the bombs in the water and let's go back. He said, no, we're going in alone. We came here to fight a war. Well, that was a wrong decision. We had so many fighter attacks. We went into a cloud and we got a lot of fighter attacks. But I know we had one engine shot out. We had a feather the, the right outboard engine. But I thought the other ones were okay. So we were flying on two on one side, one on the other. But we finally dropped the bombs, got out, and stopped for home. I didn't preface it to say that our plane carried a little less gas than any of the other planes. When Boeing built our plane, when they made the gas tank, something slipped in the wing tank. And they put a smaller tank in. So we carried a little less gas. So to make up for the weight of the plane, they used to put in extra bombs. And that's how they made up the weight. So we, we wanted to carry two, three extra bombs than the other guys because they had the weight of the, of the gas and we had the weight. We didn't have that much gas. When we came back and we landed at Saipan, I seen, I opened the hatch, there's a hatch on the side of the B-29. I opened it, I started my putt-putt, I was in charge of the putt-putt, <laughs> the start of the auxiliary uh, engine so that they, they have an electrical current in case anything happens. And uh, I see it through the window, everybody's holding their hands like this, and a lot of people coming towards the plane, you know, ground crew, ground crews and other flight crews. I know we were shot up, but I didn't think how bad until I got out. When I got out, that plane was shot up. I don't know how we weren't killed or anybody was killed. Was anybody wounded or injured? Nope. A lot of holes that looked like Swiss cheese. Huh. They never used that plane again. But when we went to debriefing, they took the pilot off the plane, and they made him air inspector. He had the rank, so he wasn't flying anymore. He was, became air inspector. 
Now, did your bombs uh, hit the target? Well, I got pictures for you here. You can see the bombs hitting. But uh, they, they sent me these after the war. I don't know why they sent it to me after the war. I mean, it was being interesting to see it during the war, but mm -hmm. they never showed it to us. It was classified. So they sent it to me when I was home. I don't, I don't know why. I don't even know if these were our bombs, but they sent it to me. Now, did you ever get a chance to, uh, did you decorate your planes at all? Yeah. We had a, well, the first plane we came over, the Japs got it at night during a bombing raid. So that burned to the ground. So we didn't have that plane. And then they kept putting us on different planes. I mean, we had V-square. Square was meant the 499 group. Let me preface it to say there was uh, four groups to the force. 497th, 498th, 499th, and 500th. I was in the 499th bomb group, the 877 bomb squadron. And they called it VH. VH meant very heavy because that was the designation for B-29s. And I don't remember the commanding general's name, but he wasn't commanding general through the whole thing. He was replaced by uh, Curtis LeMay. I'm sure you heard of him. Mm -hmm. He, I think, ran for vice president later on. But we were flying. Uh, and that plane, when I was wondering what they were all, when I got out and I saw the holes over my head, I heard it hitting. But I didn't know what was happening. I just was going like this. And boy, they were flying all over the place. And we were all shooting like hell. I came back, there was no ammunition. We shot everything out. Uh, I shot them. I don't want nobody near the back of the plane. I just shot them and sprayed. If they were in my, in my, I don't know if you know, the B-29 was the first one to have a computer. The guns were computerized. I don't know if you knew that. No, I don't know that. You didn't know that? No. That's the first, and that was the first airplane ever made that was uh, pressurized. You could walk around the plane and it's pressurized, well, same as commercial aviation. But when you got over 20, 25,000 feet, you wore an oxygen mask was when you were going or flying on a mission, when you got near the target. Because if they lost the pressurization, it would be a problem. And I as a tail gunner had a problem because when I climbed back, I used to stay in a compartment with the radar man, and I used to watch the radar with him. So I didn't have much to do until we got up to the target well, before that. So when I went back, there was a round door I'd creep through. And i got to tell you this story. First time I crept through, my parachute hooked on to the bomb site, and the parachute opened <laughs> inside the plane, and I was in a heck of a shape. And he said, don't worry, we're not going to bail out the pilot. He was called Aeroplane Commander. He said, you know, it happens to all of us. Next time it won't happen to you. And uh, that was it. But I remember that. Now, did you wear your chute into the uh, well, tail gun? Well, I, I, I got it. I crawled under my knees to the tail gun. Mm -hmm. It's a round, round door. You close the door and you lock it. You turn it. And then up front, the pilot or the co-pilot, either one, pressurizes it. You can't get out. You're sealed in. You can't get out until they take the pressure off when they want to. So you're in there and you could you could talk to them by uh, intercom. You have an intercom. So you could talk to the front of the plane and everybody in the plane mm -hmm. and all the gunners. And the tail gun, I had uh, two twin 50s and a 20 millimeter cannon in between. And they took out, after the first mission with the, with the cannon, I shot the cannon and before you, you know, when you get, when you get oh, 50 miles away from the target, you, you, you start seeing if your guns work, you test your guns, you know what I mean? And the guns were crosshairs in a computer, just like this screen, mm -hmm. and it has dials like you have on this thing on the side, and you, you get the plane in the frame, and you just compress two round things on the side, and that would have the guns go off. You don't touch the guns, you don't see the guns. They're in a separate turret outside the plane. 
uh, they have a, a, a piece of canvas inside with a zipper that if they're stuck, you could unzip it and clear the, the ammunition that gets stuck in there and reset it. So that's the way we did it. So anybody we saw near us in, the, in any of us, I had the twin 50s and the, as I said, the 20 millimeter cannon. And I also had control of the lower, lower turret. But the lower turret could swing to the left gunner or to the right gunner or to me, whoever needed it. And we used to talk on the intercom. The guy's coming from the left and I didn't need it. I'd swing it over to him. So he had two turrets. That's what we did. And uh, we had a couple of rough missions. We, the 499 took a bad hit. And uh, we lost a lot of crews. Now did, now, did you lose most of your crews to uh, fighters or to flak or a combination? It's a combination. We never had, I wouldn't say never, one mission we had that I remember is the only mission we had fighter escort. And there's a, an actor, I don't know if you, this is before your fellow's time, there was an actor in the movies called Sonny Tufts. Oh, yeah. You remember him? I've heard of him, yeah. I've heard of him? Well, he it's saved my life. Time. He's the man that saved my life. Really? Yeah. He was playing a P-51D. He, uh, the Japanese would do three things. They would shoot you down with a fighter plane. They would get you with flak or they would crash into you with a kamikaze plane. And they'd like to dive right through the center of the, of the formation, so the formation would spread out, and they'd go after them. And if they saw you were, you were hit, they'd go after you. you, know, you they knew you, the plane was shot up or hit. They'd, they'd, they'd focus on that to shoot you down. But they, the jet was, the Zero was a very good airplane. It could turn around that thing that you have here, just going around without going out, just like this. And it was a terrific aeroplane, uh, I say that. I shot down a Jap Zero, and I shot down a Betty. A Betty was a medium bomber. I never even told him, because in the beginning I didn't shoot down anything. But midway through, they stopped keeping track already. So, uh, in the beginning, the crew chief used to paint. The, if you shot down a plane, he would paint something on the airplane. I think you can mm -hmm. see. It. And if we dropped our bombs on a mission that we couldn't go all the way through and we killed a lot of fish, he would paint a, a little whale on the side <laughs> of the plane. And if we completed the mission, he would paint the bomb on the plane and counted the bombs. When I started, they said we would only do 25 missions. At the end of 25 missions, a lot of the crews were gone. We lost them already. Uh, I remember I went into flight operations and I thought I was through flying. I thought I'd you know, be grounded and go home. They said, no, you'll continue flying until we tell you uh, we don't have replacements. And the replacements are coming in very slowly. And then the, they take them out to different islands to practice bombing. And then they think they're going to shoot every plane down. And they said, if we just put them out there, we're going to lose the 29s plus the crews. So you fellas who got the experience are going to have to break them in and continue flying, which we did. But we lost a lot of people. Can I see, I, I'm, yeah. how did Sonny Tuff save you? What did oh, he do? I shot out all my ammunition. We were, had a lot of, we had a lot of fighter escort in that one mission. That was a big mission. We came from Saipan, Tinian, Guam, and I don't know if Iwo Jima was there. I don't know if they took the island yet, but I know those three were there. There was a lot of planes, and I remember we went out and uh, I shot out all my ammunition and a, a kamikaze, a Jap uh, Zero was coming into me. I could see her face. It was a woman flying that plane, not a man. She had on a flight thing, but I could see it wasn't a man. And she was heading for me, and he shot her right off my tail. She was coming 
right near my guns and he just came right straight to her and shot her right down. Blew her right out of the sky. And I never forgot him. Hmm. But he's the guy. Did you ever get to speak I saw to him? him? I saw him again because after that mission, he came to the island. I don't know how he did this. Uh, I wouldn't. He's dead now, but I wouldn't want to get him in trouble anyway. I don't know how he flew. He was on I I Iwo. He said on Iwo Jima. So I guess Iwo did fly at that time. He was at Iwo when he flew to Saipan to us, and he, he said he wanted to see the Yo crew. The officers in the crew used to get rations of liquor, scotch. I don't know, one or two bottles a year every two weeks or every week, I don't know what it was. And he wanted that. He says, I don't want medals, I don't want anything, I don't want your thanks. I want the scotch. I thought he was crazy. I said, how do you come to here? You know, they'll shoot you down because we got anti-aircraft on this island. The Japs came over every night. Every night the Japs came over for an air raid. So I got sick and tired of running out of, we had a Quonset hut. I have pictures here to show you. It's more interesting than the words. I ran out of the Quonset hut to jump into a foxhole and I got tired of it. And they used to come around and make you get out. I didn't. I stayed in bed. I put the cover over my head. I was sleepy. I know I'm going to get up early in the morning and fly another mission. So uh, I wouldn't. I said, look, if I get killed, I get killed. I didn't get killed flying. If I get killed on the ground, I get killed. I can't help it. I'm so tired. I can't, I can't do it anymore. That's all. I just can't. And I stayed there. I stayed in the uh, concert hut. These guys ran. Um, but uh, one other mission I could tell you about. Uh, there's two. What, later, when we, we made us a lead crew, you know, we, a lot of crews were gone. <laughs> they made us a crew and uh, we were flying lead, bringing them into one of the missions. And uh, one of our, we had trouble with one of the engines cocked out. So we had a, you know what a runaway prop is? The runaway prop, the, the, the propeller, the engine doesn't work, but the propeller, as you're riding, oh, keeps yeah. spinning, mm -hmm. and it gets so hot that it'll rip off the plane and cut right through the airplane. They call that a runaway prop. So what we have to do is change the blades to go this way straight. Mm -hmm. So as you fly it straight, it doesn't hit it. If you turn it at least a little this way, it's like it's regularly circulating. So we feathered the engine, and we told them we couldn't lead the, the, the mission in. So the deputy crew came over, Major Sheba's crew, I think it was. He came, and he we, we went under, he went underneath us, and we went on top. And he got hit, just as he went over. He got hit from flak, and they knocked the wings off. And the tip of the nose of the plane, where the nose cone has uh, glass, it blew it out. So it decompressed, and they must have shot themselves out. We didn't see any parachutes. We were screaming to jump. But it looked like somebody smoking a cigar. And at the end of the cigar was a big flame, you know, that somebody was smoking, and that's what it looked like. And. Uh, and he got killed, and the whole crew got killed. I didn't see anybody. I think they got killed, but we never saw them again. Uh, when we came back, they, they never came back. I, I flew missions after that. They were never there. They said they got killed in action. And uh, we felt guilty, the whole crew, that uh, we switched places with them. They used to... The Japanese, they, in the beginning, when we shot, when I shot out a, a Jap guy and he bailed out, I didn't shoot that parachute down, I let him go. The whole 20th Air Force was, at least everybody on Saipan was like that. Because we knew if we did it, we'd get it back. So we didn't do it. But then they start shooting our boys down. And when they did that, we switched, we'd start doing it. And another thing, we used to put, boy, if the commanding general only knew, we put empty beer bottles on the Bombay door. And when they go down, when the Bombay door opens up, 
they whistle going down from say 30,000 feet, 25,000 feet. And that whistles and all the, a dozen bottles make so much noise, it's terrifying. <laughs> they said, that's you, the commanding general said, that's inhumane warfare. So we had to stop doing that. But that's what we did. And once we were shot up pretty bad and we, we had a bomb hang up, we knew we couldn't land with a bomb hanging up. We can blow up the plane. So they, we decided to go to uh, Russia to Livestock Airport. And we radioed Obama uh, Air Force Control back first. They said, don't go there. If you have to go, go to Iwo Jima. We'll come back here some way. But don't go there. Or ditch in the water. Mm -hmm. Somebody, they have sub submarines on the way that can pick you up. So uh, Why didn't they want you to go to Russia? Because of the plane they didn't want? You didn't know the story of the B-29? What happened to it? The, the, uh, the Russians copied it. Oh, yes. They got a hold of one. Yeah. And made Crews went there and copied it. Yeah. They were so stupid, they copied it. They were shot up with flak, that crew. And they had flak holes. And the Russians put holes in the plane, like the flak holes. That's right. I forgot that story. It's true. Yeah. I read that in a aerial magazine that came out. Well, finally, I finally finished my missions. We were decorated in between. I have, if you want to see, we got the uh, I got the air medal with three oak leaf clusters at the Distinguished Flying Cross, and for not having syphilis, really, the Good Conduct Medal. <laughs> And that was it. And, uh, Did you ever uh, see the crew of the Enola Gay? I s no. Mm -hmm. They trained at Amarillo, mm -hmm. which was the first air base. Tibbets was there, mm -hmm. and he started training with B-29 crews. With, mm -hmm. but he left. He left Amarillo and didn't go with us to Lawrence or Harrington. He started his own air base somewhere, and those planes that he took with him, he started his whole. A group. He had a separate group, and he started, and they left there. They started somewhere. I don't know, Utah or somewhere. I saw uh, on the screen they had uh, on the History Channel unsung heroes of the B-29. I'm not saying it for that reason. I'm saying it because they had Tibbets on there, and Tibbets told his story. You know, mm -hmm. when he bombed. He bombed the first one, and I never knew he was really assigned to bomb the second one, too. But he didn't want to bomb that, and then the other crew bombed. But I'll show you my crew. We stay very close. There ain't many of us alive, to tell you the truth. Okay, yeah. We have a crew of 11. There are four left out of the Was this the photograph? This is one you sent us. Yeah. I don't know if you can recognize me. I'm over here. Uh -huh. Yep, I spotted you right yeah. away. Okay. If you uh, turn this around is, face it to, to the camera, this is the, can focus This on. is the current of the major that we had from the States, mm -hmm. and then we went overseas with, and he became the air inspector. This co-pilot next to him, Smitty, became the pilot, and we got another co-pilot Somebody was in the RAF, and I don't know, he was kicked out of the RAF. I didn't know what the reason was. He was, I heard that he was drunk and he was this and that. They didn't know what he wanted him, but we needed a co pilot, so we took him. He was a terrific pilot, I can tell you that. Better than the pilot himself. He was really good. The only trouble with him is he used to get on the intercom and speak to the Japanese come up and fight, you yelly bellies, come up, and they would come up. I said, don't speak to them, don't talk to them. We're getting more fighter attacks. And all of a sudden, we were shooting, shooting at more fighters. He said, well, the more you shoot down, the quicker you go home. That was his answer. But he flew. He was in, he never, he was in his underwear. He never wore a shirt underneath anything. He said, if I got a bailout, Japanese will never get me. I'll freeze to death. He says, because I'm not opening the chute. I'm just going to freeze. That's what he said. That's how he flew. 
Now, did you wear flak jackets at all? Yeah, wore flak jackets, and uh, when you were going over the target nearby, you wore a oxygen mask mm -hmm. because the plane became depressurized. Mm -hmm. But they had a central fire control. Everything was by, and they had a central fire control gunner, which was on, on the top turret, and he was in charge, make sure that the guns were working. You know, everything's okay. He was supposed to be able to fix it, but we never had any problems. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Could I fix noticed it. in that picture, um, you seem to have their like a nylon jacket. Yeah. Did this you was take, This was taken in the states. Okay. Did you wear the leather ones also? Yeah, I have that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. You want to hold this photo up too, and tell us about when this one was taken. Oh, this was taken when I was moving from. Uh, going to uh, Amarillo from Atlantic City. We got off, the, the train stopped. I don't know if something happened with the train. They let us off and I, there was houses nearby and the guy took us and he was taking pictures of us one at a time. So this is the picture he took of me. He gave me the picture. Okay, do you want to hold that towards the camera? My hands okay. shake a little, I can't. Yeah, okay. All right, I got it. I'll show you some pictures. That, uh, we keep in touch with that crew, the remaining ones that are alive. The one I showed you, that one that became air inspector, mm -hmm. stayed in the Air Force. He became a full colonel and retired. And my bombardier stayed in the Air Force and retired. Uh, my navigator, I want to tell you about that mission. The navigator got off the crew. He, we were on a mission, and it seemed to us coming back that we should have been back already at the, it was a night mission, we should have been back near uh, Saipan. And he said, no, you got a way to go. We know we didn't carry much gas, I was telling him. Uh -huh. I said, it seems to me the whole crew, something's wrong here. But he said, did I take you? out the side pan from the States, so I'll get you back. But something was wrong. So Smitty said to the bombardier, he also went to navigator school. He said, Smitty, take the sextant and shoot the stars. Tell us what we're doing wrong or where we are. So uh, his name was Bill Stovey. Bill shot it and said, you know, turn the plane around 180 degrees. We're going the wrong way. Oh, God. So he says, radio them because we don't have much gas left. The pilot said, we don't have too much gas left now. So how do we get back? Can we make it or should we ditch in the water? So they said, well, you could ditch in the water coming back. You know, if you can't make it, you could ditch. But you could try. It's, up, it's your call. But uh, we couldn't. The, 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 the airfield was, was clouded in at night. It was like 10 times cloud coverage. We couldn't see it. So I don't know what they did, put lights on or, or they lighted, lighted oil drums or nothing, but we saw a glow in the sky mm -hmm. and we headed for the glow and we landed at the end of the runway. And it came and my crew chief came out, he ran out, first thing he did was stick to tanks. He said, I want to see how much gas you guys got left. He said, Marty, if you didn't stop at the end of the runway, you wouldn't have got much farther. <laughs> and he was a good crew chief. He was a chief mechanic before that at Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. But he was terrific. But this was the Air Force. These are the medals I had. Okay, if you again hold them up in front of hold you, up, uh, yeah. Wayne can focus on them. Okay, I see the uh, air medal with the three oak leaf clusters on the left. Yeah. I see the distinguished flying cross in the center. Right. The good conduct medal. Yeah, that's it. And then the 20th Air Force. Yeah. Patch. And this was, uh, these stars were for uh, the Asiatic Pacific. The battle stars. Battle stars. And that's about it. Okay. Yeah, a nice grouping. And this picture you have, no sense in showing this picture, you have that. Okay. 
That's this picture here. You have that. Okay. Here's a This was the thing from Boeing that they give you when you finish Boeing aircraft school. Oops, I'm sorry. It's all right. I don't know if you ever saw that. Okay. Do you have a copy of anything like that? Uh, you don't need no, no, we don't. Well, I'm gonna, I, if you mind, I'll take it over to the office and copy. We don't have anything like this. This is the crew with the new, with, with our, with our new uh, bunch that we flew most of our missions. The uh, Can you that mission I told you about. We hold the, it up, and then I'll I'll copy that also. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Here I was with some friends. They snapped a photo of me. I used to play basketball. With there was nobody to play with more with the, with the Army, with the Air Force, because these crews were gone. I used to play basketball. We put up a thing, you know, we'd mm -hmm. shoot it, shoot it. And uh, we used to play against them, the 2nd Marine Division. They went down at the bottom. They took the island. So we used to play against them, but I knew them. And I didn't play anymore. There was nobody to play with. So I used to cook get in touch with them, and they'd come pick me up with a jeep and take me over to their area, and I'd play there, and I said, you know, if they ever have a mission and I'm AWOL, they'll shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do I do? They said, don't worry, we'll get the radio thing, and and they'll call us. You'll be able to get back. We'll get you back. They always got me back. Besides, I had a mission. I got to fly. You, you miss the mission, you'll be chopping a rock pile for the rest of your life. <laughs> This was taken by one of the Marines that were there. Turn it to the camera. Okay, it's a nice shot. Got it. And this was our Quonset hut where we lived. To the camera. Well, let him look at it first. <laughs> we lived in Quonset huts. Uh huh. The flight crews live in Quonset Huts, the ground crews. Now, are you in here? Yeah. I can't pick you out of that one. This one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hold that mic? I got it. This one. Oh, okay. I don't know if you can get it with my hands shake. It's okay. I got a familiar drama. Alrighty. Got it. These are the beer cards we used to get beer. The Munchie card. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, beer uh, ration. Beer ration. And we used to pick up the cards for the guys that were flying. Figured they'd never come back. So they gave the cards to the guys that stayed behind. So we can get more beer. <laughs> so this is the beer cards with all the punches that we had. So you see we were drinking a lot of beer. And the empty bottles went on there until the commanding general found out about it. You know, we knocked out a lot of searchlights with that. On the night missions, we dropped those weird beer bottles. Oh. You get a beer bottle from 30,000 feet. I imagine that was... And they, in the beginning, they used to search the sky for you. But later on, they were radar controlled. So when they put it on, boy, it came right on the plane. You know, they used to get you right in. And the pilot used to dive to get out of the get out of the light. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're in the light, the flak would come up. So we had that. And uh, these are all the missions I was on. So kind of beat up, but you could see what I feel. Yeah, just hold it. Just like that. It's pretty beat up. 60 years. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's all chewed up. You should keep it in a, okay. an archival uh, cover so yeah. it's safe for your family. Okay. I brought this just to show you, you know, what we did on the plane, what our MOS was and what we did. 
You don't have to see this whole thing. Just mm -hmm. this. That's where the MOS is. Mm -hmm. Our crew stays together. Mm -hmm. we, we, we email each other. We call each other. We go to a reunion. Every year, the 73rd wing has a reunion. Mm -hmm. In a different city. How many guys so, are left on your crew? Four. Four. Four out of eleven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my uh, radio man just died about two months ago. Uh, he was at the reunion with me, and I thought he was fine. And he went back home, and he, he passed away. Mm -hmm. These. Uh, this is one of the reunions uh, where we we went out to eat at a. Some kind of a restaurant there. And this is the this is the colonel. He was the one that was on the on the first mission that I told you about. Mm -hmm. Then became air inspector. And you asked me about the bombs head. You can look at these and judge for yourself. In the beginning, when the bombs went down, they didn't hit. Say classified. <laughs> One does. <laughs> One does. No, I'm no, sure no, by no, now it's not classified. It's all, yeah. Classified after 60 years. My next door neighbor, her uh, her father was a B-29 pilot. Oh yeah. Yeah. My pilot uh, in civil life, he became uh, chief of police in the uh, city in northern Florida. Okay. Okay. Well, um, did you uh, ever make use of the GI Bill after the war? Yeah, I went. Well, I was fully matriculated anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't paying anything for my education. I had good grades. I mean, when I went to city college before that. Mm -hmm. I was, I got there, you know, I didn't have to pay anything. So when I went back, I, I, I went back to City College, and I made part of the GI Bill for books and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the regular matriculation, uh, I was covered. Okay. Did you, uh, how do you think your time in service affected or changed your life? I think I think I the crews that didn't come back. I, I remember them so you know. Mm -hmm. We trained together, mm -hmm. you know, in the different uh, things we were in. Mm -hmm. Am I running over? So no, no, no. We nope. just turn the ear back on. Okay. Uh, I I remember them, and uh, there's a book written, very interesting, if you want to read. Called a special prisoner, and uh, I didn't know what the hell the special prisoner was. The Japanese considered us special prisoners because we bombed their home homeland. So if you were captured, you were decapitated. Mm -hmm. But one of the captains in my my group, and he's alive. He was captured. I saw him on television uh, a couple of years ago on the History Channel, and. Uh, I never saw him come back because I had left the island already and, I, and he came back later. He was in a prison of war camp. So I thought he was killed. But the, on the, if you look at that history channel, if you want to see it, it's called Unsung Heroes mm -hmm. by one of the uh, columnists. And it shows uh, they may have stripped him nude, and they tied his hands to a cage, and they marched him through the streets in Tokyo and all of that. Terrible. And uh, when I think of the guys that didn't come back, and I know how they got killed, and I can just imagine, it, it preys on your mind, you know. Uh, I went through schools with them, you know. We went to gunnery school, we went to flight engineer school, we went to 
mechanic school, you know, we, we were with each other. Mm -hmm. Out of uh, 21 crews in my squadron, I don't know whether it's three came back or five came back, I don't know. It's either three or five, but no more. Uh, 477 took a, before the 877 squadron took a big hit. Most of the crews that came back later that flew were replacement crews. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your yes, interview. Thank you. Okay.